Good afternoon everyone, this is Chaitali Bagh, Chief of Bureau with Aviation and Defense Universe and we are at EAMRO 2023, the second edition of uh, AM, AMRO 2023 and I'm privileged to be with Lieutenant General Dharam Veer Kalra, VVSM, AVSM. He's an ex-director of General Ordnance Services, Indian Army. Thank you so much, sir. Well, to tell my audience, he was, um, he was speaking in the first panel of this um, seminar of this symposium and um, very passionately sir spoke about the ordinance services uh, and how it has helped the indian military the all the three forces of our country so welcome to our chat room and thank you so much for your time thank sir you. so i would like to ask you first um, the the things the the topics the uh, things they were speaking on the podium on the stage today about uh, the ordinance services that has till now helped the, the military, the Indian military. In fact, you said in one line that you are here because we did it. We were there. Well. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I remember that phrase. Please, sir, I would like to know, I would like my audience, I would like all the people who still not are aware with all these okay. data. You see, uh, MRO, that is the maintenance, repair and operation or overall of activities, is not exclusive to the aviation. I have grown up in the Army. I served 38 years handling MRO for the entire fleet of the Army, some very old generation equipment to the latest one. And the problems that we faced there and the challenges that we faced there and how we overcame them, it has left some kind of a love and affection for this because there are challenges and if you meet the challenges you feel happy. Mm -hmm. So I think that experience that is there is applicable and transferable. It could be transferable to the aviation sector, it could be transferred to anybody else. Uh, as we have been talking about here in the morning, India has a great potential to develop as a MRO hub, but to know how to go about it, how to go about it is to try and find out what are the ingredients. First of all, you need the right kind of facility. That is the right kind of factories or places where the manufacture takes place, assembly takes place, repair takes place. And then also how you have an assembly line, how you have a supply chain right all through. Because you, it, the integration and convergence should not only be at the, uh, at the elementary level, it has to be at the middle level and right at the uh, baker. Throughout the supply chain must be seamless so that and all these forces must come together to produce a hub which will be sustainable which will be profitable, which will serve the purpose of the nation. Because, you know, civil aviation has a profit orientation. Yes. But the defense does not have profit orientation. It has a criticality of, of the airworthiness of the air. It should be available all the time to do the job. But then, that does not mean that you have to be two separate things. Mm. The two of you can sit together in the same facility, have different standards. You can run two parallel lines, and as you said, factory in factory, inside. You have arrangements to inspect according to your standards and he has in to, from his standards. And mind you, if you sit together, a lot of things will be resolved because you say, okay, we are doing it this way. I can also do it this way. Or maybe I need to do something more, help, help me. And I am firmly of the view that all these uh, problems of convergence because you disagree on the standard and specifications will disappear the moment you make the people to sit together and do this. Right. So, uh, here I am under an impression after the talks that we had, somehow the MRO industry is very pro the civil aviation rather than military aviation, if I am right? Well, because as you say, the profit lies in the civil industry. Yeah. Uh, the defense does not, as I said, operate. In fact, defense becomes the cash cow for the people to mm -hmm. talk on because they are demanding certain uh, specifications which are not ordinarily even. So, when they have to be produced specifically for them, then those people can demand any price. Right. This is nothing new. Hmm. You same, uh, let me give you the example, same thing that you want to buy in the market, a civil specification. Mm -hmm. And you make specifications which are military related, we got mill specifications, mm -hmm. which are more stringent. He said, okay, I have to do this for you specially. And your quantities are not large. You are asking for a small quantity of a different specification. I will have to make it specially for you, so you pay more. So this is quite common. Uh, but uh, I, don't know, I do not know how it can be got over unless the defense demand is such that it is not only for the domestic market but also exportable. Outside people come and use it, then maybe the economies of scale will kick in. Mm -hmm. But as long as the economies of scale do not kick in, this limited demand of a specialized product. 
from a source which is otherwise engaged in oil production does not make sense. I will go. I would like you, sir, to tell us a little bit more about on this on the same lines. How to bridge this gap? How to make the MRO industry? How to make the military aviation lucrative for the MRO industry? That they should find it that the way they are working for the civil aviation, they will start working for the military aviation as well. well that would be uh, somebody who's commercially oriented to answer that. Okay. Because as I said, that if you create a military oriented MRO. Military specific MRO. Mm -hmm. But the scale is such, yeah. then it becomes feasible, economical, and then it generates profit because you have a larger dependency of the foreign mm -hmm. air forces also. That is the only way this can, uh, go, this can go forward. Go forward yeah. But as long as it remains an appendage to a civil aviation and a limited quantity, uh, you are not going to be profitable or sustainable. Therefore, MRO have to be built here in India and to be able to sustain similar aircraft outside. Mm. The scale must be such, the expertise, expertise must be there, and there must be a credibility and acceptance that your certification is really acceptable yeah. worldwide. That will give you an edge and possibly then sustain. My last question, sir. Yeah. The conferences of this kind, EAMRO, yeah. which happen, and uh, great minds like you who come and discuss, and new points come up. How how much of these how much of these suggestions and points actually are being taken or been looked after later? Uh, this like point, today there this were a lot is, of new things is, which this came. Is not, this is not specific to this conference. <clears throat> See the amount of effort that goes in to put up such a uh, conference and get yeah. people over and make all the arrangements, and I'm sure the amount of human effort and expense goes into it. Exactly. A lot of talking takes place. But I think somebody did, did mention that. Let it not be a talk shop. Yes, only. exactly. Let this be carried. The question is how far the powers that be will listen to it, how much of this material is sent to them, mm -hmm. how much do they take care of it, what feedback do they, they give you. Uh, but if, if nothing else, hmm. you have got such a big crowd here, you have sensitized them about the importance of this. Yes. So people will talk about it. Your young generation will talk about it. They yes. show interest in it. Yes. So I, I think this upward travel of information will take place. Right. And somewhere or the other, after all, the government has woken up to the needs of MMRO. They've made some uh, very good provisions to give land lease for a long time, to give uh, waiver of the royalty. Mm -hmm. And the government is aware that is a need. And therefore, I think from conferences like this, mm -hmm. whether uh, through design or default, message will reach and have some impact. Especially I with the younger generation. Be, uh, if it is a, if it's a absolutely, shall I say, uh, definitive way of conveying it, then convey your uh, deliberations to them. Yeah. But if you feel that it should by itself, since in the air, mm -hmm. it should reach people, well, uh, then you're leaving it to chance. And I think you have to work towards focusing it and getting to the right people. I think in national logistics policy, people must be addressed because they've got to give you a big support. National logistic policy must be such to recognize this as a very important vertical mm -hmm. and give the, all the facilities to concentrate the, uh, shall I bring things together right. and give them all. And then the policy from the national logistic policy, it will automatically make convergence necessary. True. Thank you so much, sir. Very motivating and very positive thoughts from you, that I should expect, which definitely we got at the panel as well. Because the first panel was very, very intriguing and a uh, lot of new thoughts and the military's aviation was the key uh, focus at that time. Thank you so much for your time, sir, and Thank we you. really look forward to meet you Thank again. You so Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir.